Okay, thanks for coming, guys. Sorry, I'm running a little late. Pat, while I'm down the first floor, I had to cut my other panel a little short through the time. Because uh, I had to start late, so. Our other panel's pretty short through the time. Yeah. Alright, so we'll uh, go off of this, and if anyone else comes in, that'll be great. So, welcome to the, the Burning Blood anime, the Masami Kuramada. My name is George J. Horvat, and I'm the, I run the Land of Obscusion blog over at Blogspot where I talk about obscure anime and manga. Pretty much the stuff that you maybe might have heard of, at least in passing, and stuff you've never heard of. And this focus is going to be pretty much a, a quick little history on Masami Kuramada, and then the four titles of his, pretty much just big four titles that have all been animated. So let's just get straight into that with the man himself. Masami Kuramada was born December 6, 1953. And pretty much he started off as an, in the manga industry as an assistant to an artist named Ko Inoue on the manga Samurai Giants, which you see on the left there below, his little anime picture of himself. And then at that same time, he actually worked as an assistant for his idol, Hiroshi Motomiya, during the manga Otoko Ikikigaki Daisho, which is one of the earliest jump mangas. You can see that in the middle. Then in 1974, he debuted as a manga proper with his own title, Sukeban Arashi, which is on the right there. Sigibanashi is essentially the story of a delinquent girl. She's pretty much like tougher than the guys, and she just wants to try to live a normal life, but her attitude pretty much gets the better of her all the time. It's essentially a comedy that it only lasted about two, a two and a half volumes. It didn't last too long. His first big hit came in 1977, which we'll get to later, because I'm going to go in order of anime debut. Uh, pretty much his work, his style was inspired by the works of Hiroshi Murumiya, Mitsutari Yakiyama, the creator of Giant Robo and Tetsuji in the 28, and also Sanpei Shirada, the creator of Legend of Kamui, as well as the Gekiga style of like that really uh, detailed, manly artwork, stuff like Golgo 13, like Takao Saito's work. And that really solidified his style, which his style is kind of like a classical, manly style. And he purposely added up a shonen, like that cute boy, pretty boy flair, likely was inspired by Rose of Versailles. And that was mainly because he wanted female audiences to read Shonen Hong. He just didn't want it to be a boy, you know, female he-man, female hater club, you know, stuff like that. He wanted to have a bigger audience for Shonen Hong. And it, I think actually it did work. And so his first, even though this is his third big, uh, technically, let's see, sixth actually, if you count uh, Sigurenashi and Otoko Zaka, which never were animated, but, of course, the big one you know is Saint Seiya, which debuted in 1986 and ran until 1990 for 28 volumes. The, the idea was that with Saint Seiya, he wanted to make a mainstream hit. He purposely made this to be mainstream, and the proof is in the pudding. Less than a, not even a year in, it got debuted on television as an anime, running 114 episodes until 1989 by Toei. The problem with that, though, is because you start adapting so early on, there's a lot of filler. So it's three main story arcs. Uh, the first basic idea for those who don't know Saint Seiya, it pretty much follows the adventures of Seiya and four of his uh, saint brethren. And the saints are essentially the guardians of the Greek goddess Athena. And so they're pretty much going to take on anyone that tries killing Athena. The three main story arcs are the sanctuary story arc, which is uh, the idea of Athena trying to get, reclaim her throne over in the sanctuary, and the gold saints, who are the highest level of saints, they don't always know the truth of what's going on in the sanctuary, so they're trying to stop the bronzes. And it's essentially the first 73 episodes with a couple of little minor story arcs and a lot of filler mixed in. But once you get to the main story, it's filler-free mostly. Then you get to the Asgard chapter, which is pretty much all filler. Uh, it actually resulted in the decrease in popularity for the TV series. But now people look back on it as probably being one of the best cases of filler done in anime. I've always, that's always what I've heard. And what little bit I've seen, because that's we never got all of it. The little bit I've seen actually seemed really good, too. And the last 15 episodes was the Poseidon chapter, where Poseidon, God of the Seas, wants to try to flood the Earth because humans are dumb. Is it, isn't Vic Viz currently translating this They one? fully translated it. It finished back last year, and now it's, in, oh, and now it's like impossible to get the first half. Well, really hard to get. Yeah. Deke attempted... That's the thing. In 1996, we didn't get it. It, got, it was translated all around the world throughout the 80s and 90s. We didn't get it until 2003 when Deke attempted an edited version using the international title Knights of the Zodiac. It burns. Unfortunately, it ended at 32 episodes because it was a horrible edited dub 
probably one of the more uh, infamous things is they turn pretty much blood into all kinds of different colors, making it look like Gatorade. And Kignis Yoga, the guy in the silver down there next to Seiya, he was good. He's from Siberia. If they gave him a surfer accent. <coughs> ADV tried to salvage what they could do of the name of Saint Seiya. We're seeing it uncut, but unfortunately, Deke only licensed half the show. So hey, once, they got, once they got to episode 60, they couldn't do anything. Though they did mention that they would, they wanted to try to do at least the rest of the Sanctuary chapter. It was a sub licensing deal, so they couldn't get 61 to 114. Deke's license did expire in 2009, though, so it is a free license again. Hey, at least it's not as bad as in Yasha. Oh, yeah, got finished. Saints, and of course if it's popular manga, it gets movies, and there was a series of Saints and movies. We got four of them in the 80s. The Evil Goddess Eris, which is about the Goddess Eris trying to revive herself and killing a fiend in the process. The Heated Battle of the Gods, which is essentially a prototype of the Asgard chapter. Uh, the Legend of Crimson Youth, which dealt with Athena's brother, uh, Phoebus Abel, the god of the corona, pretty much trying to decide that humans are not worth living, and he revives any of the gold saints that died in the Sanctuary chapter. It's actually probably the best of the movies. And Warriors of the Final Holy Battle, which they go up against Lucifer. And actually those four movies are going to be released across two DVDs by Disco Tech Media under their Eastern Star label later this month. So uh, maybe if you're at Otakon, if you see them over there, go buy them. Because if these movies do well, you never know. Disco Tech can very well do the TV series, and we can finally get it all. On June, um, February 14, 2004, so partially to celebrate Paramount's third anniversary as a mangaka, there was a fifth movie made called uh, Tenkai and Joso Overture, or The Heaven Chapter, which was meant to be a continuation of the manga, because the original manga was cancelled. Nowadays, it's not canon. It's still an enjoyable movie for what it is, but there's an actual sequel called Saint Saint Next Dimension. And right now there's actually an all CG movie being done by Toei, called, simply titled Saint Seiya the Movie, and it's going to be directed by Keiji Sato, who directed Tiger and Bunny. And uh, now I'm going to show you guys a little clip from Saint Seiya. This is beyond episode 60, so these are going to be really rough, like, bootleg subs, so you're warned. <laughs>
They're good for a joke. It's it's kind of rough to watch the show with them. I tried. Is there any better fan subs out there? No, uh, uh, like yes. three episodes, up to sixty-three were fan sub, but I think they stopped. No, you can watch them on. Um... After this was. Um... Is, does Crunchyroll have them? No, they have. They, I'll get to Crunchyroll later. After the success of Saint Seiya, stu uh, animated film and Studio A and uh, decided, you know what? He had another. Po he had another kind of successful title before that. Let's animate that. So they went with Fuma no Kodro, or Kodro of the Fuma. The manga itself debuted when throughout all of 82 and 83 for 10 volumes. This is essentially just the adventures of uh, Kodro, a member of the Fuma Ninja Clan. If you're familiar with uh, the Sengoku Warring States era, you'll recognize some of the Fuma Ninjas. And uh, as it went on, it showed some of the signs of those mystical stylings of Saint Seiya. And when they did the anime, they actually brought back the composer, the series composer, Takao Koyama, who also worked on DBZ, as well as the character designer, Shingo Rocky and Michi Ameno, and that really made it look almost exactly like Saint Seiya TV, the anime, which really helps it. The anime itself was made from 89 to 92, and it covers all the three story arcs, the Yasha chapter, the Seiken Senso, or Sacred Sword War chapter, and the Fuma Hadan, or Fuma Rebellion chapter. And now I will show you a clip from uh, is this a is this Seiken Chinese Senso. Song? Excuse me? Is this a Chinese to English song? No, this one actually has never been fan sub except for one episode. I actually went through the trouble of subbing this myself for you guys. So, and I'm not that great with translators, so I went off the best I could. <laughs> The only thing they say is bootlegs. Why did you come to this place? Excuse me. 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 Excuse me.
but they were so bad at doing DVDs that they only got the first eight episodes out in 2007 before the distributor dropped them. Like, these are really bad DVDs. I, I don't even want you guys to look for them. The first 14 episodes were also shown on the Anime Network on demand, but unfortunately, Illumatoon only dubbed the first 14 episodes. So it kind of got screwed over twice when it comes to the anime. So I'm going to show you a clip from the X. This is from the TV series, and this is from a fan sub, because I guess I said Illumatoon wasn't good on Sunday. It's Do with some OVA series, apparently do a really good fan demand and interest. 
And that's made up of three OVAs. Hades Sanctuary from 2003, Hades Inferno, which was in, split into two parts in 05, from 05 to 07, and Hades Elysium, which finally ended off the Saint Seiya anime in 2008. There's a little bit of controversy with this one, mainly because Hades Sanctuary was very well made, lots of good CG. They brought back uh, Shigeyashi Yamashi, who directed some of the movies and some of the episodes, and it's, it's easily the best part of the Saint Seiya anime. Um, when they did Tenkaien, they used the same voice cast like in Sanctuary, but at that point, they were getting somewhat old, and Karamata felt that all except for Toru Furia, who did Seiya, weren't really appropriate for the roles anymore. Uh, Furia, though, pretty much felt this is like, this show's about teamwork. It's all about fighting as a team, and if they're not going to be here, I'm not going to be here. From what it seems like, those, Kermada and Furia, you know, you know, they both agreed on it. The fans didn't, though. They put out a lot of vitriol for the change in voice actors. And almost, I'm going to guess, in turn, it seemed like Toei didn't really care anymore, because the animation on Inferno and Elysian are nowhere near as good as in Sanctuary. It seemed like at this point they just wanted to get it out. Though apparently sales still maintain really well enough for it, so I'm not going to you know, complain too much. And so we're going to take a look at Hades Inferno, featuring Phoenix Zeki, who I mentioned earlier. <laughs> あいよ。お前の攻撃のスピードはさっきたっぷりと見せてもらった。お前を倒せば、その上を行けばいいわけだ。何？なんだこれは？今のが俺の上を行く攻撃か？かがさした程にも感じるわ。これでお前の死は決
Paramount originally created this in homage to Ashino Joe, the boxing classic, which is one of his favorite titles of all time. But he knew that if he just copied it, it wouldn't be anything special, and in his mind, nothing could top the original title. So what he did is he put his own spin on it using his other influences, and he went over the top, he did a lot of visual accentuation, all kinds of crazy stuff you see, and it became really big. It became what is technically the first mega hit. This title got jumped to over three million, which is kind of where it hovers at nowadays. And to show their gratitude for that, when it and it laid the groundwork for what you call traditional shonen battle manga. What happened was it, it was so popular that Shoisha was able to add <coughs> onto their building for like a new construction, supposedly because of it. Some of the workers nicknamed it the Ring Kake Building. And when the manga ended, Shoisha published the entire final chapter in color. Like every page was in color. The only mangas that have ever done that since have been Dragon Ball in '95 and Slam Dunk in '96. Uh, Kermaz is not a big fan of his anime being adapted. He just does it because it is popular. So it, it didn't happen until the 30th anniversary of his becoming a mangaka. So it wasn't until 2004 when it was actually adapted into anime by Toei with character designs by Araki and Himeno once again. So again, it looks very similar to Saint Seiya in that regard. This is made up of four titles uh, so far, I would hope. The first season, simply titled Ring Kettle 1, because there was a sequel at the time, which had the number two. Then in 2006, there was the Nichibi Kessen or Pacific War, Japan versus USA chapter. Then there was Shadow, which is based off the Shadow chapter. And then there's Sekai Taiga and Order of the World Tournament, which is essentially what a lot of this was building up to. Before I get to a clip, though, I'm going to get to the next part, which are some other Ring and Kettle 1 productions, because they actually had some interesting productions made. Uh, shortly before the anime, there was what was called a manga DVD made of it. The manga DVD was essentially an idea of like Sony Pictures Entertainment and a company called Shadow Entertainment, where they would take three mangas, in this case, Ringa Keto, uh, Kyoko Shimbuna, which was a horror manga, and, and, and Sanctuary, which was a uh, Yakuza manga, and they essentially took the panels and they made like a moving, uh, uh, like a video comic. Uh, comic. DC does kind of similar with some of, with some of their titles nowadays, and adapted the World Tournament chapter. And then also, to, get, to see if people were interested in um, a Ring Nikaketo anime, Toei made a pilot film back in uh, summer or fall 2003. I'm going to guess around the same time as the Heaven Chapter movie, because they use the same exact stat. And uh, most of the cast would return for the TV <coughs> series. And it was later released, like a lot of pilots, Shreja does, as like a mail-in order, this time with Super Jump. And if you Listen, if you look at Michael Coleman's website, the voice actor who does Cody in Super Street Fighter 4, as well as a couple other titles for Ocean, he credits himself as being the voice of Ishimatsu, which if I go back, he's the uh, short guy on the, t on the right there on the second cover of Nichibi Kesan. He said he voices him for some portion of a dub of Ring Kettle 1. I have no idea what. He said Carl Willems, uh, who was the director of Inuyasha, he said he was directed by Carl Willems. I would love to see what was dubbed in that. I don't know if it was a pilot, any bit of a TV and, series. But you see, but you see the quality of the dub and I, I have no idea. I would love to see the dub for this, but I have no idea. I do not know Carl Willems or Michael Coleman. So that is that. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the manga DVD. And after we're done with that, we're going to take a look at how the anime adapted, like the continuation of that story. <laughs>
今もあれだもはや日本の準決勝進出が決まっている君一人惨めな思いをすることもないでしょうお好きなコーナーから逃げてきたファーストスタイルいや、ちょっとさ、このコインズベリーインフルエンスファイトレディオスカーロゼバーサイ。And くわけにはいかないんだなるほどだがそうすると次の準決勝戦残念ながら日本チームは出場できないことになりますよなぜならば君が今この場で賭けることになるからだおおデビルプロポーズ決勝は一つ目に来てるワールドカップファイナルあれだ。前の試合で奴が見せた。必殺のパンチだ。ボンニュ、おやすみ。無敗の私たちを初めて破ったプレゼントとして、少しばかり手加減をしておきました。これからすぐに手当てを受ければ次の準決勝には出場できるはずさっきも言ったように今回負けてしまったら準決勝も何もないんだ完全勝利それが俺たちの真剣だからせっかくの私の行為が受けられないというのは
and it's completely new from a friend. If you've never seen Saint Seiya, don't be afraid to get into it. It just gets you caught up in the idea of the idea. I just want to know what my life is for. And the song actually is a big song. Yeah, it is. There's a good song. I haven't been like this before. The truth is going to be revealed today. I really don't have what to say. We need to let this way. Love is real. Which is the next story arc to be adapted. 
So you never know. Uh, they featured Toei, an animation by Toei, so you never know they might get back to it one day. Uh, at the same time, there's always the possibility of any other Kremata mangas or spin-offs being animated. There's always the rumor of Next Dimension, which you see on the top right, being animated. Eventually, they probably will. Uh, there's also the other spin-off slash prequel, Episode G, which is done by, um, I forgot his name right now, the creator of Shadow Skill. And uh, yeah, if you look there, if you've seen Kuramata looked really girly, look at it, look, look, look at that art. But uh, that's pretty cool, that talks about the Gold Saints uh, from Seiya's time, pretty much as a prequel, and just shows off their battle against the Titans. And there's also a, a sequel to Fumura Kojiro called Yagyu on Satsucho, or uh, the Yagyu Assassination Pledge, which is uh, pretty good. It's actually pretty good, and I actually would be neat to see that animated, but that was a while ago. When I was, that was about ten years ago when I was made. I would say, though, regardless, we'll probably still be getting animes based on Karamata's works for a good while. Uh, if Sensei Omega continues to do well, they'll probably try to keep that going as long as they can. I think Toei wants that to be kind of be like the male equivalent of Pretty Cure, where they can continually make it a new one every year. And uh, that is going to be it. This is brought to you by the Land of Obscusion. There's the website. You can follow me at Land of Obscusion. And uh, that is actually a caricature of Kramata that was from the first episode of Ringing Kena 1. Earlier on you saw one that was done more to his side. This one's actually based on the character from one of his football mangas, which is a gag manga, named Masami Kramata. So, uh, as he says, enjoy the rest of the con. Thank you. Now, not one of the more, I can tell, not one of the more popular panels here, but thanks for coming. <laughs> You still, this is still more people than I got at Anime Boston, so thank you. You're that they're making another, like, third person was making another DVD anime? They did another one, they already heard, they already spent it. No, yeah, apparently it's a wonder that he's going to do another anime series. Yeah, we got to go to the end of the panel. Oh, it's on now, but you have to know the one. We probably would want more. It depends on how well. It's only got viewers right now. They have to see how it does. Do you like it? Do you like it so much?